Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Alex White. Um, I have um, had the privilege of chairing um, sessions here in the past in the uh, energy and climate uh, space category, and I've always enjoyed it. But I stand before you today in a different uh, uh, category because I'm honoured to have been recently appointed as Director General here at the Institute, and this is actually my first uh, event. Uh, so it's, as I said, a great honour and privilege for me to uh, have been appointed to this post and very much looking forward to uh, working with you all and um, hearing your insights, um, seeing you at our events, uh, having your uh, input and responses to the excellent research that we produce here at the Institute and generally uh, collaborating with you in the uh, important work of facilitating uh, debate uh, informed debate and discussion on critical questions affecting Ireland in the world. Uh, so our agenda today is obviously energy, um, but we have a whole range of uh, areas that we take a close interest in, as you will know, probably better than I. Um, and I'm kind of in a bit of a learning curve myself uh, in my first couple of weeks. So as I've been saying to people, you have to just be a bit kind to me and realise that you probably know an awful lot more about what happens here than I do. Um, but I expect in the coming weeks uh, that, that that will change. So great to be here and great to have this challenge. So my second task then is to, uh, principal task is to welcome you to this um, IIEA webinar, seminar, um, our first of 2023. It's a fully in-person event. Um, which we're pleased to be able to uh, facilitate. And we're delighted to be joined uh, this afternoon by Harry Vamadevan, uh, who is the Senior Vice President and Regional Director for UK and Ireland of Energy Systems at DNV, the gentleman right here beside me, because we have two guests, as you can see, and his colleague Frank Kettelars, who's Operations Manager, UK and Ireland, uh, energy for, in the Energy Systems uh, section of uh, DNV and they have both been very generous to uh, come and visit us here at the IIH this afternoon, speak to us and engage with us and you're both very welcome. I uh, look forward to uh, hearing from you. Just a quick word about DNV, um, an independent expert uh, as you know in assurance and risk management, been in operation since 1864 and are the world's leading classification society, as well as being a recognised advisor to the maritime industry. DNV deliver world-renowned testing, certification, and technical advisory services to the energy value chain, including uh, in the area of renewables, oil and gas, and energy management. So Harry and Frank are going to speak to us for about 20, or 20 minutes or so each, um, and then we will go to the Q&A um, with, uh, with our audience. And I'm going to now just say a few words about each of our speakers. I'm going to introduce them both together because they're going to take over and hand over to each other so that I won't be intervening again once Harry has finished. Uh, uh, Harry Vamadevan has 30 years experience in leadership positions. He currently heads a 700 strong team uh, assisting customers to make the transition to a decarbonized energy future. He's currently head of the energy systems operation, as I mentioned, in the UK and Ireland, and is also chairperson of all of DNV's UK entities. He's an authority on the complex facets of the whole systems approach to the energy transition. Since joining DNV, he has held senior management roles in the maritime, oil and gas, and more recently, the combined oil and gas and alternative energy businesses. Frank Kettelars is currently the operations manager for the DNV Energy Systems Operations in the UK and Ireland. He oversees operations across the whole uh, energy uh, space, covering renewables, offshore and onshore oil and gas production, and gas transmission and distribution systems. In his previous role, he was director for oil and gas operations for DNV in Region Americas, based in DNV's uh, Houston office, with responsibility for ONG operations in the US, Canada, Mexico, Brazil, and Trinidad and Tobago. These operations covered verification and advisory work for offshore and onshore operations with a focus on safety and regulatory compliance. So as you can see, as you can hear, uh, we have two highly experienced and distinguished uh, speakers with us this afternoon. They're going to do a double act. So I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to start by again welcoming both speakers, Harry and Frank, and hand over in the first instance, I think, to you, Harry. Please welcome the two, our two guests. <laughs> 
thank you very much, Alex. And I have to start by actually congratulating you, um, as I suspect you've been congratulated quite a lot for the next um, few days and weeks. Um, I have to say also, I think DNB has a really good comms department because they wrote very nice bios and, and shared them with you for Frank and, and myself. Um, this is our second collaboration with the IIEA. I spoke at the Guildhall last year at a fabulous event, which I have to say, and, and as you'd imagine, Frank and I speak at various different events, but I've got to say the event that was organized by ESB and IIEA was fantastic, which is why I was really pleased to continue that relationship. For those who saw me there, I very rarely stand behind a podium. Um, because I like to kind of move around a little bit and engage, uh, which can be a bit of a pain for the cameraman. But here I will, because there's no cameraman, I will try to stay in the same place for the recording. Um, energy transition. Um, DMV's background is in energy, and it was in shipping and oil and gas and the traditional forms. And then for the last 20 years, it's been in renewables and power grids and trying to balance it. And in today's world, and, and I'll just click this. Oops, sorry. You can see, you know, it's easy to be pretty pessimistic, yeah? Um, between war in Europe for the first time in how long, the resulting energy crisis, cost of living crisis, inflation. Uh, before you even start about all the geopolitics that no doubt in this room there are many, many people who can understand, whether it's China and the US. And then in amongst all of this, you've got blocks of countries like the European Union, like um, the US with its strength, starting to exert its influence in how it wants its energy policy to evolve. And then on top of all of that, you can come to the UK and, and pretty much be sure there'll be a strike going on right now. So you put all of that picture together and it's a pretty depressing place. Um, on the other hand, all of that matters very little compared to the number one challenge, climate change and energy transition. And it's really important not to lose sight of that. And actually, like all good crises within all of these crises, Actually, there are real opportunities. And that's really, DMV is a 150-year-old, uh, we're owned by a foundation um, in Norway, and we're incredibly optimistic always when we look at technology and the ability for governments and businesses to work together to really make those change. And we genuinely believe the transformation can happen, but more importantly, it is happening. Um, I'm just going to actually ask Frank to say a word, because in addition to all the things you heard about Frank, he's actually been the project manager for our Energy Transition Outlook report. Um, he's one of the main authors, and he understands a lot about the detail, because there's one really important aspect to what we do. This is not a scenario. This is our view, most likely view, of how the world, Europe, and the UK will develop based on things like levelized cost of energy, policy statements, all of these things interacting. Frank, a few more words, or have I described it already? The, the stuff I was going to say, but, but just yeah, to say, no, so we've been, we've been actually working the last year very much to try and uh, make the, a more granular forecast look at the UK specific, but really building on the work we've been doing with the global outlook. So this DNV has been doing this global ETR outlook for the last six years. We first time did it in 2017. And very much, as Harry said, looking at how the energy system will develop over the next 25, 50, uh, the next uh, 30 years. And very much also, so we're looking at the long term, but as Harry's mentioned, I just want to maybe say a bit more about that. It's we are looking at sort of a single scenario, which in our view, based on assumptions we're making, and I'll say a bit more about when we do a deep dive later on the UK, the assumptions we're making, what does that mean in terms of what's the most likely way to set an energy system will work, rather than saying we're taking a worst case scenario, a best case scenario, and something in the middle. Also, rather than saying we will have a desirable net zero future, and how do we get there? So we're very much so taking the other approach, saying based on the technology we have, based on the assumptions we, we are aware of today, how will the system develop? And I say, and it would say also, DMV technology company, that's really, I think, where we have a lot of knowledge. We, have, we base this in general on what is going to happen to technology costs over time. So in a way, our model, the way our model works is it takes decision on applying or investing in new technologies based on technology costs. And also in there, of course, we very much want to reflect that as, as you install more of a certain technology, costs will come down. So there's some pretty good correlations around that which are reflected in the model. So at heart, we're trying to say, based on cost, well, how will the system develop? But on the other hand, we also want to reflect some of the key ambitions, targets, and expectations in the short term. The commitments people are making under, on, under the Paris Agreement, how would that reflect a, 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 our model? Um, and, and, and in some ways, also some of the things we know in the near future in terms of behavioral change that we've seen, for example, after COVID, changes in travel behavior, changes in... Um, working environment, where, where do people work? So all these things we're trying to 
add to the main thing still looking at the cost picture. And I'll say a bit more later how we approach this when we actually look at the deep dive, but Harry will also take you a sort of a high level view what's happened based on this approach, what do we see for the world and what do we see for Europe? And then I will do at the end more of a deep dive on the UK. And at that stage as well, because I'm showing quite a few charts, and it would be quite nice if you have questions, just interrupt. We have time for that, and I always found I've been presenting this quite a few times now, and I was in Aberdeen last week. I think just getting some questions and maybe discussion going is very good. So I'll, I'll, I will finish off the, after Harry's global view to say a bit more what we think will happen in the UK. Thank you. And uh, my apologies to uh, AV support. I didn't tell you we were going to do that little double act. Um, so you all know about the trilemma, clean, affordable, reliable energy. But in today's world, with energy independence, energy security, you can barely get a headline in which a country is trying to figure out energy strategy versus um, a global view and a national view. But the difficulty, and this is, this is a chart that every single one of you will know, in fact, almost every forecast says that we will miss the targets um, for limiting it to 1.5 degrees, and we will miss it by a very, very long way. And in fact, we'll be close to two degrees by 2050, and we'll be way past two degrees by uh, the end, end of the century. So the background picture can be, again, another fairly bleak view as to the current state um, of the world. But there is a transition happening. And this is, I think, one of the really important things where granularity matters, and that there is an energy transition taking place. And it is a very significant transition. It's not enough as we can show you by the impact on, on, on the degrees warming of the world. But there is one happening, and it's very significant. And there's, today's energy system is 80-20, and I'm sure you, you will hear that from many, many speakers. So 80% fossil fuels, 20% non-fossil fuels. And in our most likely scenario today, we see, for the first time actually, uh, was last year, but also getting a little bit further this year, is that non-fossil fuels is 51%. That's a significant change. That's 1% a year changing the ratio from 80-20 to get you to 50-50. And I'll come back to the net zero scenario and what's needed. Um, but it, and it's very, very simple math. So it's important to recognize, and I don't think it's talked enough, that there is an energy transition happening. And it is very significant in relative terms. It's just not enough for net zero. That's the challenge. So the bulk of that change from 80-20 to 50-50 is a story of electrification and the greening of electrification. And 70% of that change comes from this incredible set of statistics you'll see on this chart. And that's around solar, solar plus uh, solar PV plus solar and storage, um, onshore wind and offshore wind. And what you're currently seeing, and we believe this is the most likely scenario, is an 18-fold increase in solar and storage. From a, and because it's starting from a slightly higher base, a six-fold increase, which is actually a, a, a lot. It's just not a lot when you compare it to the increase in solar that you see. And then offshore wind, from a very, very low base today, a 40-fold increase. And that's over the next 30 years. And that's a phenomenal expansion of renewables. And that is driving that greening of electrification across the world. But that gives you a specific set of challenges. And as much as you know, we're optimistic about this change, there are a number of challenges coming through. Okay? And if we're really going to ramp up a 40-fold increase in offshore wind, government. And I think the IIEA will know that the policy and the role of government has a massive, um, a massive role. If you look today at Scotwind, Celtic Seas, you've got a total of 29 wind projects. Not a single one has got FID, all sitting at the permitting stage. Permitting around the world is incredibly challenging. Globally, we think it's something like five to seven years to bring a wind farm online. Yeah? If you think about the 2030 targets, and even if you approve it today, you're looking at another seven years. So there's a huge amount of inertia in that whole planning and permitting stage. And right now, if you talk to today's projects, all of today's projects are struggling on supply chain. And then you start to do the maths of the expansion. Then you start to overlay regional and country-specific strategies. Yeah? So you've got a massive increase in offshore wind, East Asia, yeah? Japan, 
Korea, Vietnam, all a lot of offshore wind. Then you start to look at the European policies, and then you look at the Inflation Reduction Act. You can imagine how individual countries are really going to struggle to prioritize their projects, and even if they prioritize those projects, to secure supply chain. There simply will not be a strong enough supply chain to match that expansion. And the other complication in today, you go and talk to most of the supply chain behind offshore wind, they're not making any money. You look at the three biggest wind turbine manufacturers, yeah, um, and they're struggling to make money. So if you look at that picture, it's a picture in which massive growth is going to be incredibly limited. Um, coming from a background in business, I've always thought if business understands the opportunity and has a good regulatory framework, it will make investment decisions. It will make investment decisions. DNV has invested heavily in hydrogen research from six years ago because we saw the pattern. But somewhere along the line, we're not generating enough investment into the supply chain. And certain countries of the world are going to lose out when the regions, the big regions, start to exert their buying power. The grid. I'm going to come back specifically to talk about the grid because I would say from a UK perspective, one of the biggest challenges we see is not developing the wind farms, even though I've told you it's a very, very big challenge. It's hooking them up to the grid. It's an even bigger challenge in terms of that because of the number of interfaces, and I'll come back to that. And then finally, what's really interesting is we have a history um, from energy, predominantly from the oil and gas side, of massive ramp up offshore. Yeah? So the knowledge is there, and we believe actually there's a lot more work can be done on both the turbine infrastructure to go offshore and also de-risking offshore projects, because that's what many, many companies, including DNV, as you probably work out from our assurance background, de-risking projects is what we do for a living. There's no doubt that we can match that expansion and support big rollout of offshore wind simply because of the knowledge that exists, and the North Sea is a great example of where you've got a lot of that knowledge. Solar, very similar set of challenges, if slightly different. Um, actually, at the event uh, I attended back in October, there was a fantastic talk around the materials and components that are behind the supply chain. And one of the biggest challenges for solar is the transparency of that supply chain, that most of the components and materials are actually coming from conflict zones. Yeah? And therefore, if you imagine in today's funding exercises the role of ESG and transparency, and then you come across a supply chain that is creaking, you're screaming for, for materials, for solar panels and all the connectivity, and then what do you do with the transparency of the supply chain when you don't have many options in that supply chain as to where you're going to buy from? So really significant issues on transparency of supply chain um, on, the, on the solar projects, and especially on the really, really big projects, almost all of the projects that we see today are late. Again, predominantly because of logistics, simply not being able to get all the components and move them to site um, fast enough. Grid, again, becomes the um, Achilles heel of very much the renewables rollout is the hookup and the movement of those electrons to where the demand um, exists. And then finally, and this is an interesting feedback from dealing with a lot of the developers, really complaining about the market and the setup for how they bid. Uh, for projects, and essentially it's almost like a reverse auction and a race to the bottom, which then means they don't necessarily have the money to invest in the growth of those supply chains. So you've got some really competing agendas um, that is leading to really um, a lot of challenges in the ability uh, not just to permit and approve those projects, but then to actually buy the equipment and get the construction phase and then the hookup to the grid done. So. Huge amounts of ambition for the growth of renewables, but really, really challenged in terms of delivery. And then, I always say, if, the front, if there's a front door to the energy transition, the grid is the key. Apps without question. Yeah? Um, and there are, again, I'd like to highlight four key areas. And um, my background's engineering, chemical engineering, supply and demand. Yeah? And generally, the energy sectors have been based on reasonably plentiful supply managing variable demand. And that's what most of today's electricity systems have been based on. The future electricity grid, as you get increased renewables penetration, and you'll understand that in Ireland, much more variability of supply and variability of demand. 
If you're going to solve a problem, to do both at the same time is incredibly hard. And you're going to have to have a huge investment in grids that can really manage both variability at both ends. And then we're talking in a sector that over the last 30 years has not had massive investments in capacity. In fact, completely the alternative. Um, years of underinvestment, yeah, because these are generally heavily regulated, a um, lot of price control mechanisms. So the actual infrastructure, A, in, in just capacity, and B, with new technologies, just hasn't been done. So trying to accelerate that is a big, big challenge. And then, in terms of permitting, yeah, I mean, you try to get a pylon approved in the southeast of England. I'm sure you have the same challenges here in Ireland. Trying to then move that electricity around. Everyone would like a buried cable, but we understand the cost of a buried cable versus um, surface transmission. So you've got huge challenges in terms of planning and policy to allow these grids to potentially double and triple. And in, the, in our global analysis, we're talking about a tripling of the grid. And that is just a huge, huge undertaking in areas that have traditionally been very underinvested. And also a big connectivity to, and this is something you know, I was discussing with Barry beforehand, is the interaction with society. Yeah? And understanding that there is, a, there is decisions to be made with the locations of renewables projects. I mean, uh, I've had a background in renewables, shipping, and in oil and gas, and I'm always astonished that we can allow shale gas onshore in the UK, but we wouldn't like some more onshore wind or solar panels. That just seems completely contradictory. Whether you agree with shale or whether you don't agree with shale, to push that forward without necessarily an onshore agenda for wind and solar just seems completely contradictory. So policy is real challenge behind the scenes as well. And then finally, the complexity of the number of stakeholders when you come onshore with the grid. So again, traditional energy projects are relatively easily developed when they're bilateral. You develop some energy, and then you sell it to someone who needs it. And then you have some investment. Today, you've got a much more circular group of stakeholders, much more connected also um, to the public. And just managing those, um, all those stakeholders and all those interfaces is actually incredibly challenging. But the end result, and this is our overall global forecast, is you know, the end result is not enough. And there is actually a very, very significant gap. The net zero pathway is not just about being zero for 2050. It's actually about negative emissions um, to be able to offset, because there are always going to be significant sectors that will not be able to abate the CO2. And if you look at our most likely forecast, where we see 2.2 degrees by the end of the century, and I've seen other, other scenarios where that's considered optimistic, 2.2 degrees. You'll see 2.3, 2.5 degrees, and our view of just under 2 degrees at 2050. Uh, again, you'll see scenarios for 2050 pr uh, presented by others crossing the 2 degrees. So what needs to be done is actually in maths, really, really simple. And that's why I emphasize the 80-20 to 50-50 is a 1% change a year. If you want to flip it to 80-20, so 80% non-fossil fuels, 20% fossil fuels, that takes you to net zero. So double what we think can, could happen. Yeah? Double it. So you get a 2% change per year for 30 years, and then you get net zero. But as you've probably worked out from what I've said so far, just delivering on the most likely scenario we think is going to be hard, doubling it does at the moment um, feel like a stretch too far. Um, a word about hydrogen, which features in almost every net zero discussion now and, and actually has an incredibly high profile. Um, and the message from us is that you electrify everything you can electrify, if you can. Yeah. Um, yes, there are some issues to do with resilience, and, and, and we'll come on to that. But as a general rule, why? Because hydrogen is ex expensive, it's inefficient, and it's not easy to move around. Okay? And that's why we haven't done it so far. So it, it's an incredibly challenging, but it is essential because we will not be able to electrify everything. That's clear. Plus, an energy system based exclusively on the electron without a molecule, you'll struggle to see resilience. Yeah? And that's the other challenge. And that's one of the hidden benefits of a gas is actually things like storage and line pack, where you slightly overpressure, uh, you run at a higher pressure, because then you can build it up. And I worked in the 90s where we could supply a third of the supply for the UK just from, sorry, a third of the southern UK's gas needs just from line pack from the North Sea. 
we could run for half a day just from line pack. Gas gives you incredible resilience in an energy system. As we have increased renewables penetration, so we will lose that resilience. So how do we see hydrogen coming? Um, yeah, there, there's, no, there's no net zero, there's no meeting the Paris Agreement without it. Um, but actually a relatively small amount of uptake in that scenario that we showed you that gets to 50-50. To get to net zero, it's triple this number. It's triple this amount of hydrogen. Um, and you'll use it predominantly in the manufacturing sector because that's the hardest to abate. Yeah? Um, there's a lot of discussion on where you can use hydrogen for other places, but really the one area is incredibly hard to abate is manufacturing, and that's really where you should start. In terms of transportation, especially, uh, we do see other derivatives, and obviously ammonia, and I know methanol is talked about at all, although methanol still produces CO2 when you burn it. Ammonia is better, but better in inverted commas. It's also another very challenging commodity to move around. Um, how do you build a hydrogen economy? Well, again, you're trying to create supply and demand at the same time. Those are, you know, it's an incredibly challenging process in the energy sector to create supply and a demand at the same time. Yeah? Um, so yes, green hydrogen is ideal, but right now, you're trying to electrify everything you can electrify. So there's a, there's, um, so there's a huge demand for electricity that is hard to then um, basically divert to green hydrogen. So hence, we see a role for blue hydrogen over the next few decades in helping establish a hydrogen market, plus has the um, other upside of decarbonizing oil and gas, which I think is also an important element. But by 2050, we, we, uh, we see green hydrogen dominating. And then finally, you'll see hydrogen very local because it's expensive to transport uh, uh, within a country or between countries. But once you start to look at intercontinental, it has to be a derivative. And certainly, ammonia is looking like a better bet. Uh, than methanol, but a lot of work has to be done to make that a reality. So, um, just quickly to maybe talk a little bit about Europe, and if we're going to get to net zero, different regions will have to take greater responsibility, and Europe will have to go to net zero before 2050 if the world is going to get to net zero by 2050. And in fact, 2045 is really when Europe will have to hit net zero to support those other regions that are inevitably going to be a little bit further behind. So what's happening in Europe? Well, quite a lot has been happening in Europe, and I'm sure um, everyone in this room pays a lot of attention to that. Whether it's the Fit for 55, which is 55% reduction by 2030, whether it's the EU Green Deal, um, and whether it's the latest one, which has just gone off the top of my head. Uh, repower, repower Europe. Um, that's the problem without having notes. Um, every now and then I do get a blank. Um, so those three, um, and Europe has actually done a huge amount um, around trying to get this whole scaling up renewables, whilst you look at the taxonomy, still trying to recognize some of the existing um, ex gas as a, as a transition. But one of the things I think is worth highlighting that I certainly don't think about, is talked enough about in the UK and many regions of the world, is the best way to have less energy is to be more efficient. Yeah? And then you have less demand. And a 32.5% improvement um, by, 20, uh, by 2030 is a great target that Europe has selected that very few countries and regions. Now, that has to be translated to national targets, but I think the emphasis on energy efficiency is a fantastic one and not really replicated in many, many nations or regions. Um, and then a couple of other declarations that came out last year, um, closely aligned to shipping, Esberg and Marenberg, very much about scale and collaboration. Scale for the offshore wind linked with hydrogen, a lot of energy highlands, and you, you, can, go, you can go to you know, long presentations about the creation of energy islands. Denmark, my boss is Danish, very big on energy uh, islands and trying to become the sort of nexus for where you get offshore wind and you get green hydrogen, but at scale, at gigawatts. Significant investment, um, but also a huge amount of collaboration on the shipping side if you're going to produce the port infrastructure for decarbonization, both in terms of the ports itself, and I know there's a few representative in ports, but also how you get hydrogen or ammonia to those ports is going to require a lot of infrastructure. So you're seeing a lot around collaboration and around scale, and really it's going to need that kind of effort if we're really going to make a difference. 
And then finally, the backdrop remains high prices. If there's one frustration, is that today's price is not based on the cost of energy. And it's one of the real problems we have today. If renewables is the lowest cost of energy, but it doesn't feel like that to the general public. So if we keep saying it and they don't keep seeing it, well, then they'd start to wonder if we really know what we're talking about. Yeah? And this difference between price and cost is a real problem today. Yeah? Um, and then also other parts of the world, I was in Singapore at a conference beforehand, and yes, they understand the war, but really they're busy saying, you guys really messed up the LNG prices for us. We were transitioning to gas, now that's going to that's gonna go further behind because you're hoovering up all the LNG, and we had a nice regasification facility we were thinking of for this region, but actually someone in Europe came and doubled it, doubled the price and took it away. So the rest of the world is struggling from this whole, Europe has the buying power to really go and get its energy needs, when many other parts of the world don't, so they will remain on coal as a result of that. Okay? So this short-term impact may be manageable in the Europe, but there'll be many other places in the world feeling those consequences. And then ultimately, Europe will fall short. Yes, again, a significant energy transition. And by 2030, it won't quite be fit for 55. We think it will be close, 50% uh, reduction by 2030, and about an 80% reduction by 2050. So Europe is doing many of the right things. And I think the focus on energy efficiency, the collaboration, the scale, the amount of incentives coming through from Repower um, and from those other, um, uh, other policies is good. They need translation. They need translation to country targets. And that, I think, is a challenge. And that's perhaps where the Inflation Reduction Act is advantageous, because it's already plugged into the US. And we already see it from the customers that are looking at. They're turning their attention much more to the US, mobilizing their resources. And it's going to be a real challenge for individual countries in this fight for the supply chains and knowledge behind renewables. Okay. You've heard enough from me. I'm going to let Frank talk to you a little bit about more granularity about the energy system in the UK. OK, that's, good. that's what I think I wanted to sort of get, try and get across a bit now in this bit on the UK, is to explain a bit more actually how we're approaching this, sort of how we sort of do the forecast and how we don't actually use those to, to actually make a bit more granular, more specific to a country, which so we spend a year on that because it's, it's one thing to say something about Europe or the world. It's actually a lot more difficult once you start putting it down to exactly what people are trying to do in the country. So, let me just try and do that. And I say, I'm very happy to take questions as we go along because it gets a bit more now about our assumptions and how we actually how we develop things. So, if you any questions on whether you if you don't agree, or if you if you would like to, no, I'm just trying to just that one there. Yes, okay. Just quickly back to this slide. I just want to say something here specifically about the UK. So, the, one thing the, the, the assessment we're doing here for the UK is a standalone assessment. Look at the UK, but let's not forget the UK is part of the global model. Of course, the UK um, has a link to the global energy system through things like technology costs, uh, the energy resources that are available, and all the economic, economic parameters. Of course, costs like carbon prices. Um, um, the various sort of um, technology costs. So very much important that we don't lose track of that and don't look the UK as a sort of, as a standalone thing in, in the world. But on the other hand, we have for the UK and of course quite more granularity on certain things that we do know are going to happen. For example, in the sort of the policy trends to phase out internal combustion engines in the UK, for example, some clear commitment to a number of industrial clusters to start producing hydrogen and carbon capture type facilities to sort of, to build that sort of I would say experience and, and market as well. And also things, one thing I think is also slightly outside the cost picture, so the, the whole thing around nuclear. Nuclear is always very much more of a policy decision. So for those areas, we do say, well, what, what does the UK government expect? So we look at the things we know about, so additional capa uh, capacities, for example, in Hinckley, in Sizewell, in the UK, uh, and, and maybe, maybe some, some assumptions about what will happen around things like small modular re reactors. So some things we actually are moving away a little bit and from just purely looking at the cost point of view, but for the majority, we actually are just trying to see what will happen with the UK type system in terms of how will actually that develop in the UK itself. So, but also just to expand, explain a bit more about our approach, how we do this. So how do we do our forecasts? We actually start very much at the demand side. So we're basically looking at things like GDP growth, um, population growth, but also how the actually use of energy changes over time in all the various sectors. That all combined gives you an idea of what will the demand look like. Then we look at what does it need on the primary side? What energy do you need to actually on the primary side to supply um, to, to meet the demand. So then again, it's based on things, what technologies are available, what is already there in terms of infrastructure, uh, 
Um, and um, what resources also are available? For example, in the UK, what sort of can you be produced uh, domestically, what needs to be imported? Once you know the de demand and supply picture, you start then looking at how, what infrastructure will I need in order to deliver it? How do I generate the energy and how do I deliver it to the customer? So what do you need in between to make it work? Again, based on what you already know, what infrastructure is there, what you need to sort of supply and in that way work out what your overall infrastructure should look like. And then we simply look at what does it mean in terms of investment. Very much focused on CapEx. We stray away a bit away from OPEX, more difficult to define, and in general, trying to get more idea of the CapEx investment it requires. And also, we have made a stab at trying to understand what will it mean actually for the consumer in the end. What actually does this mean for the average household in the UK in terms of energy costs as a result of this transition? And once, of course, we have that forecast, then we can simply start looking at what, what does that mean in terms of transitions? Do we meet the targets? Yes or no? And what can we do about it? So that's sort of our approach to, to, to this, this forecasting for, for our global model, but also for the UK. Can we go back there again? So, so start on, on the demand side. So what we're actually seeing, so in the UK specifically, that so despite growth in both GDP, about 1.3% a year between now and 2050, and population, so still the UK will grow by 40%, by 4%, not 40%, by 4% by 2050, we actually see in the UK an energy demand reduction of nearly 25%. So a quarter reduction of demand, even though we're still seeing significant growth. Um, so that's, that, that, so that's and that mainly is driven through the large-scale electrification. In general, electrification makes things more efficient, and we see actually a reduction in demand because of that, that improvement. And we see it across all sectors. It's not just, uh, just, uh, just looking at buildings or at transport. No, across all sectors in the UK. The other thing we're seeing here is this whole shift in terms of how, because this is actually demand in the way it's delivered to the customers. So what carriers are actually taking the demand to the customers? So you can see here that we actually see quite a big shift today. So three quarters of all energy is supplied to customers in the form of fossil fuels, oil and gas. So gas mainly really for heating homes and in industrial use. Oils, liquids, very much for the transport system. So you can see that even though we're talking a lot about um, a lot of renewables in electricity space, the electricity is only providing in total about 18% of the total electricity to the customer. So yes, it's important to st get started on that, but let's not forget that still 80% of our, or so 75% of our energy is still delivered directly in terms of fossil fuels, and that's all, of course, unabated, burnt in houses, burnt in your cars. So quite a big sort of um, thing to, to, to change. But, but, but looking forward, though, as a result of electrification, we see that very much then changing that by, by 2050, nearly half of all um, demand is actually suddenly delivered in terms of electricity. So that's mainly electrification of homes using heat, heat pumps. We have, we have in our forecast, about half of all the homes in the UK will be using heat pumps by 2050. Uh, and the other bit is, of course, electrification of transport, especially on the passenger side, seeing nearly a full domination of uh, EVs by 2050. So that is very much the growth of electricity uh, looking forward. You can still see there's still a third of all energy is still fossil fuels by 2050. So we're still a third of all homes in the UK so will be burning natural gas uh, in 2050, even with all the change we're trying to make. And still we see a lot of burning of fossil fuels um, around heavy transport and aviation. The more difficult to abate uh, things. And later on when we talk about emissions, we'll talk a bit more how that can be addressed. Um, and then we still see, and the other thing to mention here, in the UK actually only a limit based on costs without any additional subsidies, only about 10% of energy is delivered in the form of hydrogen in the UK by 2050. And the majority of that is not in houses, actually use of industry, as Harry mentioned, mainly difficult to abate sectors uh, in this, uh, um, to support industry, manufacturing, and uh, a little bit in terms of um, uh, low carbon fuels as well. So quite a sort of um, a big shift, but still a lot of fossil fuels in the end mix there. So then let's start looking at the actual supply side of things. In terms, in order to deliver this demand, what sort of primary fuels do you need to make this happen? And here again, of course, you see a similar trend. In general, of course, supply meets demand. But be aware as well, of course, quite a bit of losses in the system. The transformation of, of fossil fuels to electricity, there's losses in there. So you see there is a certain amount of loss in the system when you compare the supply against demand. But you can see here this, this, this big shift again in terms of that today, 80% fossil fuels as primary supply to the UK, and 20% low carbon fuels. When we look at 2050, that will actually then go to a 70-20 shift. So we see a very big reduction there in terms of where uh, our primary supplies are coming from. 
Interesting to see, though, when you look at the fossil fuel side of things, which is 80% there, so also the change is actually relatively slow still. We still think, by we, our forecast shows that early 2030s, still nearly over 70% of all primary, uh, primary fuels in the UK are still fossil fuels. So it takes a long time. And the majority of those fuels are actually still produced in the UK. So from the UK's point of view, security of supply, domestic oil and gas production is still a big part, I guess, of the overall security of supply picture we're looking at. But over time, we see it reducing. Um, um, and then really, so towards the end, selling very much 70% low carbon, with a lot of that, of course, coming from variable renewables, which is very much solar and wind. So let's then look a little bit more at sort of the electrific electrification, sorry, electrification side of things. So as Harry mentioned, I mean, the UK, in some ways, some things are more um, extreme than looking at a global level. And some things look quite similar. Electricity demand for the UK, about two and a half times increase of electricity generation in the UK between now and 2050. So today, UK generates about 300 terawatt hours a year of electricity. We'll see that going to close to 800 terawatt hours by, by uh, 2050. But as you can see as well, it's greening in the UK as well. So today, so, so as I say, there's a lot of it been achieved. The electricity supply, 58% of now from low carbon fuels today already. That will go to nearly 96%. So very, a very big change in terms of how electricity is generated in the UK. And the main reason for that, of course, the extraordinary growth of variable renewables, which is solar and wind, which is about seven-fold increase from today going to, to 2050. And you still see there's a bit of nuclear there, uh, and also bioenergy, nuclear and bioenergy providing some base load. But in terms of, if you look today, so gas-fired uh, um, uh, power generation is sort of nearly 42% of the overall supply mix, coming down to only 4%. And, you, and one of the things that also we've looked at a bit is how green is this, uh, sorry, how, whether this electricity supply is decarbonized. The UK tries to decarbonize the full electricity system by 2035. Based on what we're seeing here, that's going to be not really achieved. We, we, we see that sort of carbon capture facilities on power generation will start sort of in the late 20, uh, in the early, sorry, towards 2030. And by 2035, only about a quarter of all gas turbines in the UK will have carbon capture facilities. So it will take a lot longer till about 2045 to fully decarbonize it. So it takes time to make these changes happening. And of course, there is a big other thing that Harry mentioned. I want to say a bit more about that here, specific for the UK, just to get a bit more of a granular picture of that, the whole issue around the variability of supply. So on this, on this slide, a lot of things in there, but this mainly looks at what happens to the variability in electricity supply over time, and what you need to do on the other, when you have variable supply, how do you meet that in terms of flexibility in your system? How do you manage the variability? So what you see today, in 2020, when you look at the average electricity demand in the UK, on average, the variability across the years, like plus minus 12%, is a sort of a, very, a standard deviation, 12%. And that's mainly driven by demand variability. So that's day, night swings, it's summer versus winter. So about 12%. And if you look at it in real terms, that's about a swing of plus minus five gigawatt of flexibility you have to build in. And today in the UK, that's nearly all provided by gas turbine driven compressors that you can start up quickly and ramp up and down as required. So dispatchable, carb dispatchable power. Uh, and that is very um, important to, to provide that flexibility. Going forward, we start adding then the variability really very much around the supply side. So you can see there, the variability is plus minus 12% is actually nearly doubling to 25%. And also in absolute terms, because of course, the overall uh, average capacity goes to about 90 gigawatt. It's actually a plus minus 20 gigawatt swing. So you have plus minus five today, plus minus 20 gigawatt swing in 2050. So a huge additional burden on, on, on actually on the system to provide flexibility. And as you can see, the sort of the gray bit there on thermal generation, which is dispatchable power, is still a key part for that. So you will have to make sure that you have some form of dispatchable power available uh, to actually make this happen. And this dispatchable power, of course, it could be gas-fired turbines, but by that time, it could be gas-fired with carbon capture facilities. It could be hydrogen-fired. It could be bioenergy-fired. So it could be low carbon, but you need some sort of uh, part of the system that you can swing, um, turn up and, uh, and switch as, as, as and when required. But it's not enough. You can only provide about that. Then you really need other things. So you see a more reliance on import-export, so connectors to Europe, that you actually are importing and exporting. When you have not enough, you, ex you import. And when you have too much, when too much wind and solar, you export it. And then the other, big key, the other two parts of the story is then storage. We, we, you need a lot of um, utility-scale battery storage. We have, say, about 190 gigawatt hours of storage by 2050. 
and also have this whole power to hydrogen, P2H system. So when you have too much wind, produce hydrogen and use that then sort of as a way to, 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 to uh, as backup during low supply um, points. One thing to mention here, and we haven't looked at it so much as discussions we're currently having with some of the grid operators in the UK, is this whole issue on demand response, using smart electricity systems to actually try and shift your demand to uh, low demand periods. For example, tonight, in the UK, I think yesterday, people were actually being paid, I think, if you could switch off your electricity between four and six. That sort of thing, but do it at a larger scale. And I think there's a lot of, so maybe some of this 25% could be simply managed by having a, a smart demand response system. So we're actually having some discussions now. How can we reflect that in our model to make sure that we actually have those sort of systems? It will require investment, because you have to have additional smart systems, but to, to make sure that this will happen. So you can see it becomes a very complex system to actually manage in terms of flexibility going forward, with many different parts of, uh, to the, the overall um, uh, flexibility system. So what does it look like in terms of actually numbers then? So here we're trying to actually show for the UK specifically what you need in terms of um, uh, generation capacity. Today in the UK, total about 100 gigawatt of electricity generation capacity across all the various sources. You can see the dark gray line there, which is basically gas turbine. It's, it's the biggest one at the moment. So providing about 40, gig, um, yeah, close to 40 gigawatt of capacity there. But what you see going forward is a, a significant additional capacity. So today, 100 gigawatt we forecast another additional 180 gigawatt of capacities required by 2050 in order to provide all that, or to generate the electricity you need. And that's very much then dominated by variable renewables. By 90% of the additional capacity is all variable renewables. And as you can see there as well, dominated very much by offshore wind. The other thing I always want to get both people out as well, these are big capacities, but what you also have to keep in mind is the actual capacity factor of all of these, these types of generation. When you look at nuclear, they sit pretty close to 85, 90% online. So you get, when you install 100 gigawatt, you get 90 gigawatt on average coming out. Offshore wind is sort of around, is, is currently about 40%, might go to 50%. Solar, 60 gigawatt, only has about 13% capacity factor. So you see 60 gigawatt of solar gives you not as much as you would expect when you look at these sort of charts. So a lot of additional overcapacity needs to be installed to actually make sure you can meet the average demand. Of course, that also has an impact on that you sometimes far too much, which you can hopefully export or use for other, other purposes. But you can, so in addition then, you also, in order to actually um, to transmit and dis distribute this electricity, you need a lot of investment on, on, on the grid side of things. So we say a threefold increase on the grid, and it's not only, so it's both transmission, a lot of the new renewables that are being generated are in places like offshore Scotland, Need, need to be at first transmitted back to the areas where you need it. And then also you would do a significant amount of additional distribution in all the big city centers. So a lot of investment there in order to handle that throughput. And as I mentioned before, we actually will need also a significant amount of additional battery storage. So what does this mean then in terms of investment? So we, had, we looked at all the investment around the energy system and we got many, many different parts to that. But looking at what happened in the past and what's looking, looking forward. So in the last 30 years, on average, the UK spent about 17 billion pounds a year on uh, infrastructure spent for energy. And 50% of that was developing offshore, well, mainly I would say offshore fossil fuel resources. Looking forward, we see a number nearly doubling, about 28 billion, not exactly double, but a significant increase. And a shift away from fossil fuel, 70% on renewables and grid systems, less than 5% actually invested on the remaining um, fossil fuel resources in the UK. So that's a big absolute increase, but we also had to look across that whole period looking at what does this investment look like versus GDP. And we actually see an av it more or less stays relatively uh, stable at 1% of GDP. So that is, in a way, a slightly more positive picture. So yes, absolute terms a lot more, but as, part of, as a percentage of GDP, it's actually quite stable. And that should, and we see similar, I mean, there's a bigger number globally because more needs to be done in terms of the energy transition. But we see a similar sort of stable thing at the global level as well. So that's, I think, I would say a more positive view on the additional money we need that we actually can, uh, as a society, should be able to afford it. The other thing we looked at is the whole thing, what does it mean then actually for spending for households, uh, household energy spending? So we're looking at cost of electricity, cost of things, yeah. Uh, what, how do we, um, uh, what does it mean for the average household spend? So what we see here, on average for the next two, well, the idea is expectation the next three to four years, while we have the current crisis, prices will stay high. But very much 
once we get to sort of a more stable situation, also with more renewables in the system, we see a significant reduction in the average household spend. Actually, more than half reduction of average energy spent in, in each household in the UK. A lot of that both linked to um, transport, your cars, uh, and also heating your homes. So a lot of this sort of savings is around being, having a more efficient system, uh, using less energy, and overall de uh, energy demand works at 25%, but also seeing continued reduction in electricity prices going forward, uh, after, I would say, the, the difficult crisis we're going through today. Um, we have time to, let me just define, the, 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 uh, looking back at uh, what does this mean then in terms of um, our emissions. Um, so overall, of course, UK, like the rest of the world, I mean, has been a lot of progress has been made to actually reduce emissions by, by about 50% since 1990. But really, based on this trajectory, we'd see that we would not meet the, ter the targets under the Paris Agreement to try to get to 68% reduction. And also by 2050, still, having, uh, still emitting about 120 million tons a year of CO2, which is 85% reduction, but very much still seeing um, um, emissions linked to especially heating of homes, and um, uh, the transport aviation sector. So we then say, when we're taking it back to the whole story around the energy trilemma, security, affordability, and transition, in some ways, from a security point of view, yes, things are looking better. We actually are seeing, of course, 95% of electricity is generated from domestic low-carbon resources. And we're seeing a reducing reliance on sort of fossil fuel imports. It's still some there, but the trend, the reducing trend is there. And should, and, and should uh, very much improve security supply. Affordability point of view, yes, less energy demand. Investments, high investment, but in line with GDP, still relatively stable, and also showing that household energy is, household costs actually reducing. But from a transition point of view, it shows that purely looking at sort of cost, I would say market-led transition, we will not achieve yet zero. And then it's clear, so we need, especially at the moment in the UK, we need, I think we probably need some very clear early decisions, especially I would say on things like how to heat your homes, how are you going to, how are you going to, as a country, try and resolve that, and then have very clear business models, roadmaps around that, so, so that we actually can incentivize this uptake of low carbon technologies. So I'll leave it at that, and I saw it, I'm also running out of time, I hear, so. So there you go, so that's, I think, take it from the global picture down to sort of the European level, and then very much our view is that actually once you take it more granular, it becomes more interesting, because you can actually start looking at what it actually means in real, investment decisions you have to take. So currently, we're actually now talking to a lot of our stakeholders in the UK about this to get their sort of input on our assumptions and see how we can sort of accommodate that. And that's, so thank you for your time. So I'll hand it back to you.